uh, the Odessa network appears to be a private sector, legitimate commercial enterprise. But as we dug deeper, we discovered that it was also trafficking in arms to countries that were subject to international sanctions. And it was doing so with the official imprimatur of the Russian government and the Putin regime. Furthermore, what appeared to be a network of independent shipping companies, port authorities, and maritime service providers turned out to actually be a very hierarchical power structure that was operating with official Russian government sanction, trafficking in weapons, in order to support Russian foreign policy and reinforce the Putin regime's internal controls through the distribution of both licit and illicit wealth. The Odessa network was leveraging both licit and illicit financial, logistics, and infrastructure facilitators and enablers. Its illicit activities spanned the globe. We found the topic because of our analysts. In this case, our analyst, Tom Wallace, a Russian language laureate out of the University of Iowa, saw the expanding conflict in Syria and asked himself, if Syria is under an international arms embargo and sanctions regime, then how are they being rearmed? Looking at Syria's history and the external relations of the Assad regime, he hypothesized that the supplier had to be Russia. So he asked himself, if it is Russia, how are they doing it in the face of internal sanctions without getting caught? Before he could get to the illicit aspect of the trafficking, he realized that the first question that had to be answered is how Russia would do it if it were illicit. By studying the activities and agents in a legal arms transaction, he was able to infer the necessary illicit activities. He could then select relevant and competent data sources by backwards chaining along the evidentiary path. There were several practical reasons why we took this approach. For one thing, the Syria problem was very much in the media and we would certainly have garnered more attention if we had focused our efforts there. However, it seemed to make little sense to focus on an inaccessible and data sparse battlefield that was only the end point of the arming effort. Furthermore, if we'd stayed narrowly focused on Syria geographically, we never would have been able to fully examine the network enablers because they were outside Syrian geography and control. If we had focused more narrowly on Syria, we would only have seen one particular illicit operation rather than the network as a whole. During this process, we learned that there are some general principles that aid in the analysis of illicit power structures. One, all illicit networks touch licit networks somewhere. Two, to have an illicit capability, there must first be a licit capability, and three, Human networks do not behave like machine networks. They are polyvalent and unbounded. This drove our methodology going forward. We know that our methods work because our analysis has led to sanctions and seizures against banks, corporations, and individuals through our assistance of efforts at the Departments of Treasury and Justice as well as other agencies like Scotland Yard and the World Customs Organization. More recently, we were asked to examine the network that perpetrates, facilitates, and enables hate speech against Muslim minorities in Myanmar. By examining licit communication in the region, we focused on certain social media outlets and then determined the best tools to use these sources. For this project, which resulted in our report entitled Sticks and Stones, we mined Twitter and Facebook. The end result highlighted the impact of a few key communicators. Today, the Buddhist community and enabler, now fully aware and unhappy with the actions of this group, is applying pressure to disband them. Both enablers and facilitators need to be part of a licit system. By influencing enablers, we are able to address conflict drivers without adding more conflict to the system. This, however, has major implications for the scope of analytic efforts and the impact of conceptual and regulatory stovepipes. These implications have driven us to prototype and push reform along four planes. Personnel, integrated analytic approaches, understanding a networked operational environment, and the absolute imperative of integrating non-governmental and extra-governmental licit networks like our own to enhance the velocity and effectiveness of government action against illicit power structures. In projects that we titled Ivory's Curse and Out of Africa, we analyzed ivory poaching. Our work was so successful it led to major ivory seizures, provided a better understanding of the conflict economy, and facilitated constructive alliances with global law enforcement organizations like Interpol and over 104 NGOs, including the National Geographic Intelligence Unit and the World Wildlife Foundation. By examining hypotheses about the overall trafficking system, 
We were able to identify relationships between perpetrators, facilitators, and enablers, both in the countries where the environmental crimes were taking place and all of the others along the supply chain to address the challenge along several fronts and empower government action. For example, at one point, we had initiated four of the top six environmental cases being prosecuted by the DOD National Transnational Crime Support Center. Open source intelligence, unclassified information, also known as OSINT, had the reputation of being ad hoc, static, providing little data advantage and being vulnerable to deception. An expert would read something and make a qualitative evaluation that was not replicable by any other expert. Most documents were static references like country studies. Public records had minor relevance to the conventional fight. Because it was not fused intelligence, a decision maker looking at open source material would have no advantage over anyone else who read the same readily available information. And it would be simple to place deceptive information into the media. The quality and quantity of information has changed, however, and today there is so much data available that it can't be ignored. The challenge is which data to examine, and unfortunately that often means, in government especially, that analysts allow the immediate tactical imperative to drive the analysis rather than letting the analysis drive the investigation. By recognizing drastic changes in data availability, the network nature of the threat, and using a variety of available analytic tools in a replicable process, we've been able to provide data-driven and quantitative reports that address each of these concerns. After the Odessa network report was published, Military Sealift Command later canceled major shipping contracts with the perpetrators and facilitators we had exposed. So CalBuy and others challenged the report in ads and CalBuy threatened to sue us. They were not only impugning the quality and accuracy of our work, they were creating an environment whereby our very ability to conduct this kind of analysis and publication would have been jeopardized. After six months and 11 hearings, we won our suit against CalBuy with prejudice. As uncertain as it was to go through the court battle, it was important for us to do so. Like many of the illicit networks we investigate, we can and will use the legal system and legal sanctuary to our advantage. Our legal victory over CalBuy was about much more than vindicating our work on the Odessa network analysis. It was about not conceding the legal system to illicit power structures who will use and abuse it for their own illicit purposes. Thank you.